So I'm really excited to be here. This is my first SCS meeting, and I'm excited to talk about how genetics and genomics can be used to conserve God's creation. This is something that has been uh, something I've been very passionate about over the um, past uh, couple decades. So in the 19, well, actually in 1980, conservation biology was sort of born as an independent discipline. And it was at that time that scientists realized that we didn't only need to conserve species, but we also needed to con conserve genetic diversity within species. Because genetic diversity is actually the raw material for natural selection. So without genetic diversity, a population or a species is not going to be able to adapt to environmental challenges that it faces. And around that same time, so in the 1980s, um, 1990s, there were a number of genomic advances, genetic and genomic technology advances that occurred that allowed conservation biologists to assay genetic diversity more easily in natural populations or look at how genetic diversity is partitioned between populations and how gene flow connected populations or even to look at familial relationships between individuals and wild populations to answer conservation related questions. And so that became the field of conservation genetics, that line of inquiry. And the flagship journal of that field was launched in the year 2000. So I'm first going to start off by talking about three major technological advances that really allowed for the field of conservation genetics to kind of come about. And the first is polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. And I'm pretty sure anyone who's taken a biology class, a basic biology class, has heard about this. But um, essentially, it allows scientists to isolate a particular reach of DNA that's of interest and make billions of copies of it. And with those billions of copies, you can then do downstream analysis, like electrophoresis, to separate fragments by size. Or you could do Sanger sequencing, actually determine the sequence of those DNA fragments, and see how they differ between individuals or between populations. And the next major advance was quantitative PCR, or real-time PCR. And this technology has two advances over regular PCR. So like regular PCR, it amplifies sections of DNA that we're interested in. But what's different is that the qPCR instrument, what we use to do this, has a fluorescence reader in it. So when we're amplifying a particular reach of DNA, we can design a probe that's specific to that reach of DNA. And we can have probes for the different variants at that locus, so different alleles. And by looking at the fluorescence that we can read in the instrument, we can determine the genotype of our sample. So there's no need for downstream analysis at all. Um, another advantage is that you could use the relationship between PCR cycle number and the increase of fluorescence to determine the starting copy number of DNA in your reaction. And that's something that can be of interest for environmental DNA applications that I'll talk about later. Another really cool thing about quantitative PCR is that it's extremely sensitive, more sensitive than sort of standard PCR. It has a theoretical detection limit of three three DNA copies per reaction. So you could have a 25 microliter reaction with three copies of your target DNA, and your assay theoretically should be able to detect your target. Okay, the next and probably most dramatic advance in this field has been the advent of high throughput sequencing. And the, we've had Sanger sequencing around DNA, basic DNA sequencing around since 1977. But in the late 1990s and early 2000s, we just had an explosion of different um, advances that led to our ability to determine the sequence of entire genomes very cost effectively and very quickly. So these figures are a little bit dated, but they, they get the main point across that in the mid 2000s, you just see a precipitous decline in the cost of sequencing sequencing genomes. So the, the x-axis there is in, um, it's the cost of sequencing a million bases of DNA. So in 2010, they were down to 10 cents per million bases of DNA sequenced. And then it's extremely high throughput. So um, you can see in this graph that um, we're getting hundreds of millions of kilobases per instrument per day. So we're, we're able to sequence multiple human genomes per day with the technology that we have. It's pretty incredible. And because it's cost effective, it 
was affordable for conservation biologists who do not have as much money as people funded by NIH. Um, <laughs> and with an extremely high throughput, we could analyze lots and lots of samples and ask questions beyond our wildest dreams just 10 years ago. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how my research program has applied uh, the, these three techniques to inform the conservation of fish and wildlife populations. And I first want to introduce my laboratory. It's called the Genomic Variation Laboratory and it consists of undergraduates, grad students, technicians, postdocs, project scientists, and me. <laughs> and um, we all are really excited about using genetics and genomics to inform conservation. And the first project I wanna highlight um, relates to the Sacramento perch, which is that cute little guy right there. And um, this project was one of the dissertation chapters of my first PhD student, Amanda Cohen. And the, the main question driving the research was how populations of Sacramento perch were related to each other. So what's cool about Sacramento perch is that they're the only native centrarchid in California. So centrarchids are fish like bass and, and bluegill, which you have lots of out here. Um, but it's the only one that's native to California. And historically, they were found in that orange blob there, so the Sacramento and San Joaquin River Valleys. But they've been com almost completely extirpated from their native range, and now they're only found in little isolated water bodies, mostly reservoirs or lakes behind dams, um, scattered throughout California and even some in Nevada. And the California Department of Fish and Wildlife wants to put Sacramento perch back into their native range. They want to introduce, reintroduce it, so start new populations back in the native range. But before they did that, they wanted to know about the genetic diversity of the different populations and how they were related to each other, because they were going to use that information to choose populations as sources to do these reintroductions. And so Amanda used PCR and microsatellite genotyping along with genetic clustering analysis to identify that there are two major genetic groupings or clusters within Sacramento perch. And we call them the red cluster and the blue cluster very creatively. <laughs> um, and what she found afterwards, she, she took that data set and divided it. She wanted to see if there was substructure within those two groups. So were there groups of related populations within those two clusters. And I should mention that each of those rectangles represents a different population, and the colors are representing genetic uniqueness. So she did find that within both the red and the blue clusters, um, there were multiple genetically unique lineages within them. And I'm sorry for the table, I don't like to put tables in talks, but um, this highlights another one of her major findings that the population in the blue cluster, the, the four that are highlighted there, had less genetic diversity than populations in the red cluster. And that was true if you looked at heterozygosity or the number of alleles or the affected population size. And so what that told us and California Department of Fish and Wildlife is that those populations were, one, going to be more vulnerable to climate change issues like drought, especially in reservoirs, and also that they probably wouldn't be the best sources to use for reintroduction, because if they have limited genetic diversity, it's gonna be harder for that population to adapt quickly to their new habitat and, and thrive there. Okay, the next project I wanna talk about is actually one that I've been working on for the past 16 years. And I've been privileged to work with the Kootenai tribe of Idaho, up in the panhandle of Idaho, um, helping them with their captive breeding program for the endangered Kootenai River white sturgeon. That picture doesn't really do justice to this very majestic species. They're living dinosaurs, essentially. They've been around since the Jurassic. Um, and, and this particular population of sturgeon is really in trouble because a dam was put in on the Kootenai River in the 1960s. And the dam changed the pattern of how um, silt was moving through the system, and their only spawning site in the Kootenai River was destroyed. So there has been no natural, pop, no natural reproduction in this population since the 1960s. But these fish can live over 100 years. So there's a remnant population of wild adults still in the river, and they've been able to use those adults as um, broodstock for this conservation aquaculture program. And what's so cool about working with the tribe is that they're not only 
Work, I mean, they're working with the state and federal agencies to manage this endangered population, but they also feel that they have a mandate from their creator to care for all of the fish and wildlife on their lands. So they are actually also spiritually invested in helping this, this population recover. So every year, tribal biologists go out and they collect males and females from the river, spawn them in captivity and remove, you know, put them back, and they rear their offspring in captivity for about a year until they're large enough to survive well on their own in the wild, and then they release them into the wild. And my role is to isolate DNA from all of the parents that they use and genotype them or take a DNA fingerprint basically so that we can keep track of all of how much genetic diversity they're conserving in their population. And also it can be used later for parentage analysis, which is something that one of my PhD students is working on. Um, right now, when they release fish from the hatchery, they are typically a, about the size that they can receive a pit tag, which is very similar to a microchip that we would put in a dog or a cat. So when these fish, after they're released, if they're recaptured a couple of years later, for example, in a monitoring survey, they can just scan the fish and say, okay, it's from the hatchery, it's from this year class, and it's from this family. But the tribe is interested in t testing out, road testing basically, some habitat that they've restored for rearing of larval sturgeon. They want to know, OK, we did all this stuff. Is it actually going to work for larval sturgeon? And again, there's no natural reproduction. So the only source of larval sturgeon is a hatchery. So they want to release these larvae, which are far too small to receive a pit tag. So um, what my student is doing is she is taking a new type of genetic analysis available to us, high throughput sequencing, um, which historically has been very difficult for us because sturgeon are polyploid, and we can talk about that later. Um, but she's exploiting the fact that each individual has their own unique DNA fingerprint. And if you, so it's almost like a tag. So if you collect genetic samples from offspring that don't have tags, and you have the genetic data from the parents, you can perform parentage analysis to confirm that the individual that's been captured is from the hatchery and determine what year class and what family. So she looked at four different year classes um, from the hatchery and performed parentage analysis using this um, high throughput sequencing and SNP genotyping. And her accuracy levels for assigning the correct parents range from 94.7 to 98.7%, which is well within the margin of error that the tribe feels comfortable with. So we're really hoping that with this new technique, they're going to be able to do their experiments soon. Okay, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about environmental DNA monitoring or use of environmental DNA for monitoring, because this is a new area of research in my lab, new in the past five years or so. And um, environmental DNA, or eDNA, is essentially just DNA that's floating out there in the environment, typically um, in cells or, or clumps of cells that originate from skin cells, um, from mucus, if you're talking about fish, uh, excrement, decaying carcasses. So all these things are giving off DNA. And you can collect it and analyze it. And eDNA has been collected from water and soil for quite some time. And now there's, there were two groups actually very recently working independently and then together when they found out about each other to see if you could vacuum eDNA out of the air. So now that's the thing we might be able to do, which is really crazy. And um, there's different ways to use eDNA for biodiversity monitoring. And I wanted to give an example of how this might work if you're interested in one particular species. So let's say this guy here, he's interested in finding out whether or not rainbow trout are found in that water body. So he's going to be pumping water out of the water body. And it's going to be passing over a filter with extremely um, small pore sizes. And so the, those clumps of cells, or those cells floating around in the water, are going to get stuck on that filter. So then you bring the filter into a clean lab, which is a lab that is maintained in such a way that there's not a lot of DNA on the surfaces or on the equipment. Um, and then you can perform a DNA extraction in your clean lab, and then do qPCR with a probe that's specific to your target species, in this case, rainbow trout. And if you see a fluorescent signal, you know, OK, there's rainbow trout in that system. You don't need to actually even try to capture the trout. You can just tell that it's there from its eDNA, which is pretty exciting. And this can be scaled up to actually look at the composition of entire biological communities. So um, 
with, if we take PCR and we amplify regions of species genomes that are known to be specific to each species. So you've probably heard of DNA barcoding where there's just certain regions of the genome that tend to be different for each different species. We can take advantage of that and we can collect our eDNA like we did in the last study, extract it, and then perform PCR with primers that are sort of universal that will work for lots of different species to amplify those barcodes. And then we can perform high throughput sequencing of the PCR product, and with some downstream bioinformatics, we can tell all of the different species that are present at that location. And this is something that my lab has gotten involved in. Um, we're looking to see if eDNA metabarcoding can complement the existing biodiversity surveys that are going on in the San Francisco estuary, because there's a lot of surveys that use things like trawls and traps and nets, which all have their um, strengths and, and weaknesses, and so we're thinking, you know, maybe this can provide some additional information in those surveys. So my PhD student, Ann Holmes, and her undergraduate intern, Sarah Perry and Kiana Yearwood, were conducting a project um, where they're using eDNA metabarcoding to see first what was in Puda Creek, or a, a tributary to Sacramento River, and also to compare the results from metabarcoding to some traditional sampling methods that were going on. So that thing up in the left corner there is a rotary screw trap, and it's something that samples fish out of the water column. And then she collected water samples alongside that gear to see what samples she detected versus what samples the screw trap detected. And she found that eDNA detected 13 different fishes, fish species, whereas the rotary screw trap only detected six. So for various reasons, you know, behavioral differences between species of fish, the eDNA metabarcoding was more efficient at, at capturing the biodiversity data. Another really cool thing she, she noticed is that the species composition in Puda Creek changed as you went from upstream on the, the creek to downstream. So upstream, and the, each of these bars just, um, the different colors represent the proportion of, of PCR product that originates from a particular species. And the upstream most reaches, she found that prickly sculpin and stickleback were the, the most abundant species found, and those are native to Puda Creek. But as she went downstream, the proportion of invasive species increased. So at the downstream most site, she found mostly largemouth bass, bluegill, and common carp, which makes sense because the water is warmer there, there's more invasive aquatic vegetation, and those are things that those invasive species prefer. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see something that we kind of knew from ecological data, like to see that borne out in the eDNA data. Okay, I have no idea how my time is. <laughs> Seriously, I'm talking really fast, or I'm forgetting a lot, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you guys are going to hear a lot about CRISPR-based genetic species ID. So this is an area that my lab is involved in that we're really excited about. We're collaborating with the California Department of Water Resources, specifically um, Melinda Bearwald there and, and the, her staff. And we're using CRISPR to perform genetic species ID for species that are difficult to tell apart visually. And when you hear CRISPR, the first thing you think is probably CRISPR-Cas9. That's the CRISPR complex that's most famous, I guess. It's the one that's used for genome editing applications. But there are lots of CRISPR-Cas complexes, and they all do different things. So in 2015, 2016, a group at MIT was interested in using CRISPR-Cas13A, so a completely different CRISPR-Cas compound uh, or complex, to see if they could identify small amounts of viral DNA or RNA at a patient's bedside in remote conditions. And the way CRISPR-Cas13A works and why it was good for this is that, um, like qPCR, it uses, instead of a probe, it uses a guide RNA, and it guides the CRISPR to the, the target region. And instead of making a single cut and then being done, like Cas9, it just starts chopping up RNA all over the place. And if you put um, RNA reporters into your reaction with a fluorescent label on it, um, the chopping up of the RNA will cause a, a big fluorescent signal that you can detect in the fluorescence reader. And so um, 
they thought that if you could have an inexpensive fluorescence reader, you know, in a hospital in the Congo or something, that you might be able to detect uh, viral DNA at the patient's bedside. You don't need an expensive lab or expensive equipment to do it. And we decided that we wanted to see if we could um, adapt this platform for biodiversity monitoring. So the first project that um, we undertook um, with Alicia Goodblah and Emily Funk from my lab was to see if we could develop Sherlock assays for three different smelt species that look very similar to each other. So longfin smelt and delta smelt are either state threatened, like the longfin, or the, the delta smelt is federally threatened and state endangered. So it's important to be able to tell those two species apart from the wakasagi, which is an invasive species that no one cares about. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you've heard anything about the Delta smelt. That there was a lot of political stuff about it um, in the 2016 election. But the gist of it is that because it has so much protection, um, when these smelt, these listed smelt, go near the water pumps that um, California uses to pump water down to Southern California, because Southern California has no water of their own, um, they have to actually change the operation of the pump. So it's really important to know, OK, do we have a delta smelt by the pump, or do we have a wakasagi? Because if it's a wakasagi, things keep going on as normal. If it's delta smelt, OK, we have to think about how we're going to change our management strategy. And if you think they look alike here in this picture, they actually look even more alike at the juvenile stage. So we've documented through other studies in the lab that it, the Visual identifications made in the field are often inaccurate. But what we found um, comparing Sherlock and a qPCR assay for delta smelt is that, well, I should have mentioned the Cas13A complex um, is called Sherlock. Um, that's how the MIT folks labeled it. Um, that it uh, was more sensitive than qPCR. And also, you could determine whether or not your target species was present in a much quicker time. So um, we can tell if in our reaction we have a delta smelt within about 20 minutes, whereas with a qPCR, you can see you'd probably have, you're, you know, you're kind of waiting for that exponential curve to, to, to know that you have a positive. You're going to be waiting about 40 minutes. So you could get almost real time um, genetic species ID. And we also found in a moonshot kind of experiment that we didn't need to do a DNA extraction. We could just swab the side of a smelt dip the swab in a buffer and put a, an aliquot of that buffer into the reaction and get a positive, a strong positive. Um, so that was um, unexpected but very exciting. And we have a whole team of people working on Sherlock now after the success of that initial experiment. And um, a, we really think that there's a lot of great applications for this, this technology, um, eDNA. Five minutes? OK. Yeah, so it, detecting eDNA. Um, we also thought that uh, detecting animal disease in the field, such as chytrid fungus, which is um, decimating amphibian populations around the world. Also, just in remote locations or in the global south, where funding resources are, aren't um, as rich as they are here. Um, you can get, you don't need expensive equipment, as I mentioned. The fluorescence reader is battery powered. Um, and then lastly, we were thinking at border crossings, where Fish and Wildlife Service agents are looking to make sure that the paperwork for wildlife products that are coming in and out of the country matches what is actually in the shipment, because you've probably heard about seafood mislabeling and that sort of thing. So if they had an assay for a particular target species, they could tell within 20 minutes if that species was labeled correctly. Um, so I'd just like to end by acknowledging the funding organizations that um, funded the work I've described here, and also just acknowledging my amazing students and staff. And I'll be happy to take questions.